Culture and Diversity Lead for the environmental consultancy organization Marine Plastic Solutions, Kayla Williams is a social scientist who seeks to tackle the plastics problem by prioritizing sustainability and best practice, while also addressing issues of poverty, education and gender equity. I'm going to talk to everyone today about women in waste and I'm just going to kind of capture that within the realms of my field of expertise. I mean, you know, the discussion of SDG 5 and SDG 10 is so enormous. So to just really phrase that within what I do as part of MPS, which is the consultancy I work for and have a bit of a discussion around my insights and what I can share with you all today. So let's have a look. So Women in Waste, a perspective from environmental consulting on donor funded projects in small island developing states. So just a little overview, I'll kind of go through the consultant context, um, women in waste management and SIDS broadly, and then just touch on some interesting highlights from some of the consultancies that I've worked through recently. Okay, so the consulting context. So that's a little picture of some of my immediate team. Um, Marine Plastic Solutions is an environmental consultancy. So we have an in-house team as well as a broad number of associates we work with on a per, per job basis, um, as well as local teams. We, the closest we've come to working in Australia is Norfolk Island, <laughs> as we specialize in international work. So that's kind of the context that will be mostly focused on, yeah, the, the um, well, the SIDS, the Pacific Island country and Caribbean area, but I'll get into that. So. There we go. Yeah, so my background is in social science, even though I work in a hard science technical area. So I have lived and studied across Australia, the Western Balkans, Japan and the Pacific. So I have, I think, an interesting lived experience perspective on these different contexts as well. Um, I've got eight years of experience in international donor funded projects. So I've got expertise basically in community engagement, intersectional approaches, normative behaviour and gender and vulnerability assessments. There we go. So at MPS, we do work around strategy and policy, technical services, research and data analytics and education and training. So what we're doing from job to job is massively different. On some jobs, we might be helping to establish a plastic strategy for a government. And then on other jobs, we may be working on market assessments or looking at value chains for different kinds of waste, or we may actually be coming up with education modules and training staff of hospitals or kinds of stuff in how to manage their waste. So it's a very broad field of work. So what is waste? I thought just good to cover because a lot of the time when you tell someone you work in waste, they've got no idea what you mean. So waste is anything that after you've used the product, product you've got something that's going to get thrown away, something that's going to get incinerated, sent to landfill, recycled, something's going to happen to it. So this is everything from solid waste, which is everything, if you are in Australia, that you put in your red bin that goes off to the landfill. Um, in other countries, it's all incinerated. In other countries... There's not a lot of good options at the moment. Um, there's healthcare waste that comes out of your hospitals and everything. There's shipping waste that ends up at ports. E-waste, what happens to your laptop when you finish using it? Um, hazardous waste, so asbestos and used lead acid battery. So it's a really broad area of work. And all what wastes um, bring their own challenges and have their own best practices and solutions. So... That's what I say when I mean waste. Um, the consulting process, I just briefly want to mention to kind of also explain where we fit into the work that goes on. So in consulting that we do, there's a sponsor or a donor. So we work with a lot of development banks, Asian Development Bank, World Bank. We work with the UN. We work with the European Investment Bank. So all these great donors who have money to make fantastic things happen in developing nations. So they come up with what they want done. 
which is called like the terms of reference. They put them out. They see what people will respond with and will put in our bid. And then they'll decide who they want to contract to do the work. We then perform the work as the implementing body for the country or the community who's going to receive the aid. So that's where we sit within this network of operations. So it's a complex kind of um, party in which you've got who's paying for it, who's receiving it, and then who's implementing it. So there's a lot of people who have their different ideas about what needs to get done and a lot of people to keep happy. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a bit of a dance. But, yeah, so these are just some nice little photos out of interest of some of the work that we've done. These are some photos that have come out of the Caribbean and out of the Pacific. As you can see, just beautiful natural scenery that's being really badly bogged down by waste but um, there's fantastic things that we can do and are doing about it. And in everything we do, we always try to make sure that we're aligning ourselves with the SDGs. So the SDGs for us as an environmental consultancy, they're like the highest order of things that you want to tie your actions back to. They're the Bible for our work kind of thing. So whenever we're doing a project, this is the same for the donors who are funding it too. Everyone wants to make sure that what we're doing is in line with the SDGs, is helping them to creep forward and is helping them to achieve that overall people, planet, profit baseline where things are good for the environment, they're good for our community and they're good for the global society. We do have our particular SDGs that we focus on. So the environmental ones are probably no surprise, so 11 through 15, but we actually do have a special focus on 4, 5 and 10 as well. We recognise that even though we work in a technical field, it's a human problem. So waste and rubbish doesn't come from nowhere and it's not going to be resolved magically. People are a critical element and so that's why that's really important for us to kind of keep at the forefront of our minds as a consultancy if we want to achieve that long-term transformational kind of success with these communities. So with SDGs 5 and 10, which are our focus today, they're something that is very interesting to me as culture and diversity lead. We also have an expert who works on education. So I work clo quite closely with her as well to get information on how we're best going to serve these communities and make sure that our activities are aligning with these particular goals. I've just pulled out a few of the targets that have often come up when we're actually doing projects that we're kind of making sure we're linking back to. Uh, but yeah, these are very important SDGs in our work, especially as we work with very vulnerable communities. Um, it is funny, probably funny to think like, what do women have to do with waste? But I always say at the very least, they're 50% of the community. <laughs> so, you know, that's a really big point. And then it, moreover, the interesting thing from our perspective too, is that the role of women and girls, particularly in developing nations, because it is stereotypically quite close to home, they have lots of um, roles around caring, domestic work, um, that kind of area that actually presents a really unique kind of quick win because they're also so likely to be informed about what kind of items and products are coming into the house and then what kind of waste disposal behaviours are happening as a, as a result. So when we take the needs and the knowledge of women into account, we're more likely to come up with solutions that are going to benefit the entire community. So I'll move on now to women and waste management in SIDS and just give kind of a, um, a little bit of a background to it. So the SIDS, I've got my little map up here. There are a whole bunch of them. So we can see over on the right of the screen, just above Australia and everything, these are the Pacific Island countries. We also call them the PICs. Um, there is 15 roughly of them and there I'm sure lots of people have been on lovely holidays to them. They're right in our backyard. I think that Australia should feel a strong sense of custodianship over them to make sure you know that we are thriving in our region. 
We do also have way over on the left here, all the Caribbean SIDS, which we've done a bit of work in as well. And then you have kind of a scattering of them across the rest of the world as well. So just for today, I'm really talking specifically about the PICS and then the Caribbean SIDS that I've got quite a bit of experience with as well. So just to give you kind of a visual of where they are in the world, because when we talk about places like Kiribati or um, Niue or Palau, often people are like, are you sure you haven't made this country up? <laughs> you know, you've never heard of this tiny island. But they're really fascinating locations. You can see actually in this picture up the top, this photo taken outside of a plane, that is the tiny little stretch of land that is actually um, Tarawa. And it's just amazing, these atoll countries where most of the land mass is sunk away. So you've got people living on these tiny little stretches and obviously your land becomes such a precious commodity in those instances. So it's all the more important to make sure that you're looking after it so that your community can, yeah, thrive and do well. So just to touch on some of the barriers that exist for the SIDS, there's a lot of unsanitary waste behaviour. So when I say that, I mean stuff like burning, burying, dumping, littering, uh, waste management plans and policies, as well as legislation. They're still being developed or often the coordination between them is still quite poor. So there is a heavy reliance on donor funded technical assistance and many states and national governments actually lack financial instruments. So that's like taxes, levies, fees to support waste management in their countries. Education and awareness efforts similarly lack measurable goals um, and they have a bit of an issue when it comes to connectivity between them as well. So those are some of the common barriers we come up against. But there's a lot of really good success stories too. There's been many instances of successful CDL, so that's container deposit legislation. So that's when you buy your bottle of soft drink, you go away, you drink it, and you bring it back, you put it into a machine, you get your 10 cents back. That's that kind of system. So the other successes include community recycling and composting initiatives, which have been going on in Fiji. There's been recycling, recycled toilet paper has been being made. There's been great composting of organic waste for home and community use in Tuvalu and the Solomon Islands. And um, at the moment, MPS is actually engaged in a really exciting project that's all about assessing the feasibility of a regional recycling center for the 15 Pacific Island countries. So to see massive amounts of stockpiled waste and waste that's been left otherwise stranded, making sure that's actually all getting collected and recycled, which is great for jobs. It's great for the environment. It's a great opportunity for women. So there's some really great things happening. Um, MPS has also recently just been successful in organizing the shipment of 42 tons of stockpiled pet plastic that's going to pour out of Kiribati and Marshalls. We're getting it all sent to a recycling organization in Australia to get turned into our pet. So that's the equivalent of 4.2 million pet bottles. So there's some really great things happening. And as I mentioned before, there's some great opportunities for women due to their role as household managers and primary carers. And this is what I'm gonna speak on further. So just to give a little bit more information about women specifically in the SIDS, the three main barriers that I'll talk around are social cultural factors, lack of opportunities and policy and legislation. Um, so when you're looking at how people's power is governed in different communities. It's interesting to look at four kind of main points. It's interesting to look at access to assets, beliefs and practices, practices and participation, and then institutions, laws and policies. So these factors determine your power and power in, ter in turn informs, you know, who has and who can acquire um, authority, um, assets, it affects decision over like your body, over children, it determines what individual opportunities you might have, what rights you can exercise, 
um, what kind of legal contracts you can enter into, um, what institutions and policies are going to affect you, how you're going to be treated socially in your workplace, in your gender hierarchy. So personal power is really, really important. So these are three of the key challenges where we see across the SIDS women, yeah, meeting that kind of that kind of um, imaginary wall of not being able to break through into having more personal power. So traditional views on what constitutes women's work, roles as carers, division of labor and the double burden, gender-based violence, um, accessing education and training can be hard. There can be issues accessing loans and networks. And then there's a lot of trouble around having legislation to support stuff like flexible work and childcare. So just before I move on to some highlights from the consultancies that I've been working on, I did just want to touch on um, requirements and goals of donor funded projects. So obviously when we do our work, we're beholden to what our terms of reference ask us to do, what the donor has paid us for, and then you know what the community is looking for us as well. So there's kind of a three party discussion so really positively, just in terms of the requirements of these projects, we've seen a really great move away from tick box exercises. When people first kind of were starting to get interested in, oh, maybe these waste pro projects should involve something to do with women or some kind of social element, there was a little bit of like people could just kind of go, oh, yes, we, um, we talked to some women about it and that would be kind of it. They'd go, all right, tick, you've, you've done what you were asked to do. But we're moving much more towards, okay, you talked to some women about it. And what did that mean? And what are you going to do with that information? So it's really good to see that we're getting to that next step of, of action. Um, collection of and use of sex disaggregated data is a huge part of this. And aligning um, whatever we're doing as part of our project with the actual policies that the countries have in place as more countries develop their own national policies and um, yeah, gender policies, women policies. So making sure that we're at every point that we can having good connectivity and yeah, making, and then also a lot of our projects are actually having criteria about they wanna see recommendations. They wanna see a policy or a legislation review. So having a lot more concrete action stuff that is getting away from that kind of passive, oh, well, we, we thought about it, but didn't really do anything kind of stuff. So a big part of what I actually do is gender and vulnerability assessments. So I've got my little, my little image down the bottom here of people walking up their hill. So this is to visually represent where, where we are in a lot of these developing nations and where we wanna go. So gender reinforcing is exactly what it sounds like whatever you're doing, the action you're taking is exacerbating or conforming with the stereotype. Gender accommodating recognizes, okay, there's some different, there's some things here in this socio-cultural situation that are gonna make women's participation tricky. But we also know that there's limits with how much we can change in what time. So what, what are workarounds? How can we, mitigate barriers without having to go through the path of complete social upheaval which may not always be possible because we're after change that is realistic and practical and achievable as well and that gender accommodating step is incredibly important because that's what's going to get you to a gender transformative approach where things actually have changed in massive ways and you're seeing huge leaps and jumps in what women are able to do. So it's really important to do these assessments because it helps us to understand what's happening in communities and helps us to understand what women want from these communities and how we can get them to best participate and to best meet their economic development needs. So lastly, I'm just going to take you through a few highlights from some of the consultancies that I've been working on. I've picked out some that I think had particularly interesting um kind of revelations on gender i've got two examples from the pics and one from the caribbean so hopefully you can see some interesting little differences but you know all the similarities as well so i'll kind of just talk around key themes key findings and the recommendations we ultimately came to 
So one of the projects that we're actually currently still working on, we're working on phase two after having successfully worked on phase one is the Stronger Business Program in Solomon Islands. It's a massive program to help develop Solomon Islands into a thriving country and a tourist destination. So we've been working on market system assessment and waste value chains. And then we've also been seeing what potential there is to leverage all of this work as a chance to really develop women's economic independence. So I conducted a gender and vulnerability assessment and came up with recommendations, identifying some possible entry points to improve opportunities for women's empowerment in the private sector. So we're really looking around recycling jobs and uh, entrepreneurship opportunities. So stuff like CSOs, which are civil society organizations and um, waste banks and value adding kind of areas where women can make really interesting products from waste. So after the initial assessment, we found some interesting things in the Solomon Islands. So one of the interesting findings was proximity to home, which I've talked at length about. So that this is kind of a, um, a barrier and an opportunity in a weird way. So if women are expected to spend a large proximity of their time at home, how do we gender accommodate that and use it to still help them develop? Um, there were a plethora of activities. So since the late 90s, there have been a really interesting and great range of environmental initiatives and projects and other organisations that had popped up to develop women as leaders. Um, but there was that connectivity program, uh, connectivity problem, once again, of how do you get all these things to talk to each other? Because too often there's this case where a group of women have been trained up to do something really great but then that activity is ended. And then rather than the next activity picking up where they left off, they just start afresh again. So this is kind of an ongoing struggle in development projects. There's so many projects happening. It's hard to have them all talking to each other, but yeah, how do we create some more linkages? And the last interesting area was informal waste work. So across the Pacific islands, there are informal waste workers on a number of landfills and dump sites. So these are families and micro enterprises or individuals who actually live and work off dump sites. So they actually pick through and will take things like aluminium cans and scrap steel and sell them off. And so they're actually playing an important role in the waste sector, but it is informal and unrecognized. So how do we help the women who are working in that kind of dangerous, informal arena as well. So ultimately we came up with some really good recommendations around promoting coherence and connectivity. We said that support could be cultivated from strong male champions. Um, this had been done successfully in the past with um, the Archbishop of Isabel province and the Premier of Isabel provincial government supporting the Mother's Union of Isabel province. So we'd seen this kind of success in the past we could get those strong male leaders from communities to champion women. Um, opportunities also existed to partner with established local women's groups. So there were great groups like Plastic Wise, Gizo, uh, Mother's Union, who I mentioned before, um, and others to work with them to kind of, yeah, get that connectivity going, don't start from nothing, and take that kind of train the trainer and creche approaches as well to women who do have a limited ability to leave home. So actually like training, you know, an individual woman who can then go back to her community with that training and disseminate it to the other women or having systems by which like creche childcare could be organized so that more women can be participating in things. Um, some other interesting recommendations were around targeted training and providing PPE and equipment to particularly women waste workers. Um, so that they can be involved as well and promoting that image of women as leaders in their country. So the second project I just want to touch on is a project we did in the Eastern Caribbean. So this was Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, Dominica, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we looked at what was happening in those countries in relation to waste. It was a marine plastic debris scoping study. So we were doing a diagnostic of plastic management inventory for those countries. 
So what I did as part of this was once again, they'd asked, the donor had asked for a gender and vulnerability assessment. They were really interested in identifying areas where women could enter the private sector and be involved in recycling opportunities well, and really interested in entrepreneurship, which is a big area for women in waste in the developing world. So looking at what kind of policies needed to be changed or developed, what kind of measures had to be taken to nudge target groups to adopt this more inclusive behaviour. So really interestingly, we found that unlike the Pacific, women in these Caribbean countries actually have really, really great rates of education. So they're actually more likely to complete secondary schooling and tertiary education and they consistently outperform their male counterparts. So the issue here was not a lack of education or training. There was some kind of failure to get from A to B. So we'd still had all, we'd had all these women who had reached all these great level of education, but then they weren't getting employed. So something, something was going on there. So similar barriers existed in business where there were lots of women who had micro franchises, micro enterprises, but then they were lacking that ability to connect with the formal system. And that was largely informed by a lack of legislation that supports them. So you get a lot of women who work outside of the formal system, so they can have flexibility around childcare or you know, other commitments and stuff like that. So those were some really interesting points that we kind of came out with from this project. So here we were really interested in how do we make the leap from education to employment so we had a lot of really great recommendations around partnering with local groups to catalyze on enterprise and job creation, um, using activities within current and future projects to champion women, um, delivering, delivering targeted training, developing grants and funds. And a really big part of it was around the development of legislation. There needs to be better legislation for carers, leave work arrangements, child allowances, that kind of thing. So we were talking a lot more around what policy could support women and a lot more about what kind of funding could be made available. As, as I said, there was absolutely no lack of well-trained and well-educated women. So the final, final project I want to touch on, I know I've spoken at length, but before I leave if you guys with this day is the Vanuatu government's plastic strategy that we worked on 2019, so a few years ago now. So my work as part of this, so we were reviewing plastic usage and pilot options for the reduction of plastics to produce Vanuatu's and the Pacific's first national plastic strategy. So I was looking at the research around the of gender, implications of a proposed nappy ban, um, plastic materials replacing traditionally used organic materials in like markets and just attitudes towards waste. So interestingly, I think two of the points that I just wanted to end on was that we've been talking at length about women, but just in the spirit of SDG 10 as well, that it's actually not even just a matter of kind of environmental, you know, health, this work, it's a matter of people's dignity. The presence of improperly managed waste in the land and the marine environments negatively impacts how people feel about their communities, about their lives, their national pride, their senses of happiness. And having a clean, healthy and sustainable environment is actually a human right. Um, kind of sadly, it only became a recognised human right by the UN in 2021. I was really shocked to learn. I was like, oh, I wonder when that came into effect. And after a little Google search, it was only October last year that the UN Human Rights Council adopted this res resolution acknowledging it, but at least here we are. So yeah, just remembering that in that spirit of reduced inequalities, it's actually everybody's right to have a clean environment. And it's part of um, our responsibility, I think, as people benefiting from living in the developed world to not leave our developing world friends behind. So there was also interesting um, information around mixed feelings towards a nappy ban, um, different areas of support around that. And it was just an interesting thing to end on as well for women, because I think it's important to not, not push forward with interventions when they become troublingly technical. So just to end on the note of social visibility and waste management and make sure that we're not 
coming up with things that on a from a technical perspective look great but from a social perspective could cause a lot more problems for vulnerable members of the community so yeah thank you very much for listening to me talk at length about an area that is so interesting and so complex and feel free to ask any questions here and reach out at any time later thank you very much <laughs>